the talk is about when can we recover an adverse running graph uh, for what values of peaks from its one neighbors. Uh, maybe let me first explain what is the question. So uh, consider I have a graph G, I have many vertices, many edges. Now I will pick a vertex, I fix a vertex, see here, and then I look in at all, all of neighbors of this vertex. Okay, I have this. Then uh, by one neighbors here, I'm considering the induced subgraph generated by all the vertices of the neighbors of this vertex, including the vertex itself. So in particular, I have uh, these structures, which I call it the one neighbors. Uh, it's the induced subgraph. So in particular, it not only contains edges containing C and its neighbors, but if two neighbors of the vertex C is shared by an edge, then we have this edge inside one neighbors also. So what's given is not just the degree of the vertex, also the sort of the structure of the neighbors. And our goal is to recover the original graph if we have been given each uh, one neighbors for every vertex. Of course, with this, I have no issue of reconstructing the original graph. I know what these vertices are. So there are one more step, except the center vertex C, I will remove the labels of the, each vertices in the neighbors of this vertex. So what really remains is really just the structures of the neighbors. I know it looks like this. This is the neighbors of C, that's how it looks like. However, I don't know what is this vertex. I don't know this is actually A. Now, the question is, I have been giving all such one neighbor structures for every vertex of the graph. And then the question is, can we reconstruct the original graph based on this structure? So in short, this is trying to reconstruct the original graph to see if it's possible just based on these uh, local structures. Okay, and I'll give a little bit motivation. Uh, so this was, uh, first was surround assembly of DNA sequence. So this is about try to reconstruct the DNA sequence, but the current technology, what people can do is you just scanning a random piece of uh, the DNA sequence. Random because we don't have a control of which pattern we want to scan. So what you get is a little piece, little piece of the DNA sequence, and you want to recover the original sequence by matching them up. Like you have the same pattern, possibly these are the same. Uh, you, you can stick together correctly. And in this way, you can view it as a line graph, and the graph has some sort of coloring on it by ACGT. Another example is a reconstructing neural network. It sounds different, but the story is the same. It's like what they have in experience is like trying to reconstruct the neural network of a mouse. But again, each time they can only scan a partial of the whole neural network. So again, they have some local graph structure of the neural network, and their goal is to uh, reconstructing the original, uh, the whole neural network. And so this is the motivation, but not much was developed uh, in terms of the mathematical theory. So the it first appeared is in 2015. Uh, this was uh, by Morso and Rose. They proposed the question of reconstructing a graph or a label graph. You can think of a graph with already colors on it uh, from neighbors of a given radius R. So the one we have seen at the beginning, this is the one neighbors. You can do the same construction for R neighbors. You can look at all those points which with distance at most R to their center point and looking at the induced subgraph, remove all the labels of all, any neighbor vertices. And they discuss uh, the problems on Erdos-Renyi graph, random jigsaw puzzles, random deregular graph, and some random, not maybe deterministic graph, but with a random coloring of it. And 
how can we uh, when can we recover the original uh, graph and is there efficient algorithms and there are many results after uh, the result of Mosser and Ross, but we will focus on other friendly graph in this case. So what has been done in other friendly graph uh, is mainly done by Mosser Ross and Gaudian Mosser in, now it's two years ago. Uh, so in the original paper of Mosser and Ross, they show that, okay, if P is a lambda over N, where this is a graph in which uh, the expected degree of each vertex is roughly lambda for the error training graph, then uh, if you're looking at the R neighbor with R roughly of the order N, then you can reconstruct uh, the original error training graph. And that's up to isomorphism because some, for some vertices, you cannot distinguish them. From the local structures. And then there's also a reconstruction for P, a little bit less fast. So this is when P equal to uh, grows faster than log n square over n. Uh, it's worth to remark that uh, when P is log n over n, this is roughly the connectivity threshold. So with this, this is very, with high probability that our GMP graph is connected then three neighbors is sufficient. And as for one neighbors and two neighbors, for two neighbors, it works for uh, P strictly greater than N to the negative three over five. It doesn't work for P less than N to the three over four. And for P greater than one, uh, it works for P strictly greater than N to the negative one third. And it doesn't work for P strictly less than uh, into a negative one half. Okay. And now I'll expand a little bit of the one neighbor uh, result from Gaudio and Mosso by how it works. So, first, this is uh, maybe let's get familiar with the one neighbor. How does the one neighbor look like? You have a point in the GMP graph, and then I'm looking at its neighbor. How many main neighbor does it have? Every other vertex is a neighbor of V with probability P, and there are n minus one such vertices. So roughly there are MP neighbors, right? And this is sharp because this is simply just the concentration of some of the newly random variable. It's highly concentrated around MP. So basically, if I'm looking at the one neighbor structure, of course, there are many edges connecting these neighbors. If I looking at this one neighbors, but I'm ignoring V, really this looks like another adolf friendly graph with the same probability P, but only uh, MP vertices. And the complexity of such a uh, GMP graph, when P is fairly large, arise from how you assign these uh, edges connecting the neighbors. So the complexity comes from here. Okay. So this is the one neighbors. And first I will discuss how uh, the positive on the positive side, why one neighbors works for P greater than N to the negative one third is considering the intersection of the one neighbors between two points on an edge. Suppose I have a vertex V and I have a vertex W. They are connected by an edge. And then now I'm looking at the one neighbors, the intersection of their one neighbors, meaning that really these are the graph containing V and W. Also, at the same time, all the vertices, which are common neighbors of both. Right? And of course, I'm. Um, connecting uh, if there's any, sorry, this is a very bad graph. If there is any edge connecting the neighbors, then this is inside their uh, intersections. And by the same argument, this is roughly like, uh, another other friendly graph, which is GMP square P graph. Uh, they are roughly MP square common neighbors of V and W. 
every vertex is a common neighbor of these two uh, points with probability p squared. So we have this. And now it's relying on the complexity of this graph or their common intersection. If this graph is unique in the sense that uh, it cannot be isomorphic to the intersection of uh, any other one neighbors. If I pick any other two points, if they are not unique isomorphic, the, then there's a way to distinguish uh, every other edge, right? You can identify each edge by this uh, intersection of one neighbors. And by this way, if I just looking at the uh, one neighbors of each vertex, this graph always lies in uh, the one neighbors of V and the one neighbors of W. I can use this way to identify the edge VW or identify the uh, edge connecting to V with the point here, which is W here. So this is how it works. So you have a sort of a unique match in this case. You can reconstruct the graph by just looking at two one neighbors uh, of the corresponding vertices. And then why it doesn't work when P is, uh, so, and P and P equal to N to negative one third is really the case where your graph is having uh, insufficient complexity where you can find uh, two graphs with high probability actually are isomorphic. They're one neighbors, intersection of one neighbors isomorphic. And for p strictly less than uh, n to the negative one half, uh, first of all, now the expected degree of numbers of edges on the one neighbors are less than one. So for example, you have uh, the center vertex, you have many other vertices on the neighbors, then most likely for each vertex, there is no uh, edges connecting it with other uh, neighbors. So in the whole graph, maybe there are a couple of things, but uh, all at each neighbors, you don't see any other uh, edges connecting them. So you don't have much complexity on the one neighbor structures. And this is the main reason. Indeed, this can be done with a counting argument. You can count that. Um, the typical realization of GMP, oh, let me correct this, this should be little o of uh, that. The numbers of typical realization of the Erdorf-Renyi graph is much bigger than the typical realization of uh, the re typical one neighbor structures. So originally maybe we have a lot of GMP graph, the space of GMP graph and the space of uh, one neighbor structures. And this is the space of GMP. Uh, but with very high probability, your GMP graph lies in a smaller set. For example, I have the constraint on the total numbers of edges. I have the constraint on the uh, degrees of each uh, vertices. You can say that with very high probability, these are typical GMP graph. For the same thing, you can do the same thing on the one neighbor structures, but you can show that basically when P is uh, smaller than n to the one half, the typical realization of one neighbor structures is much smaller than the typical realization of GMP graph. So in other words, while we have a mapping from uh, each graph to uh, with very high probability, your graph lies in this and the one neighbor lies in here. And then naturally you have a map from uh, the graph to the one neighbor structures. But because of the cardinality, you expect many of these uh, one neighbor structure will be the uh, where many graph maps to. Therefore, you cannot reconstruct the graph uh, from the one neighbor due to this is not unique representation of the original graph. 
Therefore, it doesn't work in this case. And we have a gap between n to the negative one half and to n to the negative one third. From n to the negative greater than n to the one, negative one third, we have this simple uh, matching uh, algorithm which can reconstruct the graph with high probability. Here, just because of the counting, it doesn't work with high probability. Okay. And this is a joint work with uh, Tate Midroth. And in last year, we showed that, okay, actually the graph is uh, reconstructable uh, for P greater than N to the negative one half times uh, a polylog N factors. Uh, the 3.01 is not important, but uh, I guess we could push, if one push it, maybe we could push it to log N times uh, N to the negative one half. And then uh, it is unique reconstructable uh, for this GMP graph. So really now the gap is, uh, it's reconstructable when uh, P is greater than N to negative one half times polylog N and not reconstructable when P is uh, little O of uh, N to negative one half. So there's a polynomial in N gaps there. We haven't get to a sub transition yet, maybe. I guess there should be the sub transition. And so this is our result. And on the other hand, this result is also not, um, we don't have an uh, efficient algorithm in this case. So top this is just proving that most of the GMP graph with high probability, then it has a unique uh, one neighbor structures. Okay, so first, thing, um, if you look at the intersections of the one neighbors from edge AB here, just like we did before, uh, this is no longer unique when P is getting close to the anti one on half. So reconstruction cannot be rely on just looking at the neighbors or one neighbors of two. You need some uh, global information derived so that you can reconstruct the original graph. And so I have a minute left. I will talk a little bit about the proof idea. So to do that, I need to have some notation. So as soon as I have a deterministic graph, uh, G, I will let G tilt be another graph defined on the same vertex set at the same time that uh, it has the same one neighbor structures. Of course, I always has one choice, at least one choice for G tilt. I can just pick G tilt equal to G, but this is not very interesting. So whenever it's possible, we will choose G tilt not equal to G, okay? So this is something deterministic. I don't know how this function is defined, but I can always choose one. So we first fix such deterministic uh, function from graph to graph. Then uh, associate with it, we also have a function which is the local graph isomorphism from the one neighbors of G to the one neighbors of G tilt because they have the same one neighbor structures. I'll call it FV. Remember, we define this graph on the same vertex set. So V is both a vertex of uh, G and G tilt. We have a uh, iso local isomorphism on uh, neighbors of V in G to neighbors of V in G tilt. Of course, uh, we have uh, this constraint that FV must be equal to V. Then we can rephrase our theorem in an, uh, in an informal way like this. If I let gamma be a GMP graph, then I, is what I need to do is to show with high probability that gamma and gamma two are the same graph. Uh, or if we validly, I need to show that FV is the identity map. Uh, from yeah, from the neighbors of G to neighbors of G tilt. So there are two steps. First, we are showing that uh, gamma and gamma two are not too far away from each other, and the second is showing that to find some self-bounding inequality to force if they are close to each other. Somehow we have another strategy to show that they must be the same with very high probability. So the second step is just find another type of constraint to improve this. And I will talk a little bit about the first step. 
So the part one is about why uh, gamma should be very close to gamma tilt, right? Uh, the reason is otherwise it will create a loss of dependence. For example, I'm considering here as my graph gamma and here as my gra graph gamma tilt. I have a vertex V and I have two neighbors of V, U and W. Same here, I have another vertex V prime. I have uh, the neighbors U prime, W prime. So here, I don't know what the, whether U, W is an edge or not, or what U prime, W prime is an edge or not. But suppose I have the following scenario. They have been mapped incorrectly in the sense that uh, my FV, which maps V to V, but uh, U to U tilt, W to W tilt. At the same time, my V prime also uh, maps, well, V prime to V prime, but V prime to U, U prime to U tilt and W prime to W tilt. If this is the case, uh, let's think what would happen. If UW is an edge, then because FV is a graph isomorphism, it falls U to W to is an edge as well. But then I can put it back via uh, FV prime, which is another graph isomorphism. You force U prime W prime to be an edge as well. Therefore, whether UW is an edge or not, is the same as whether U prime W prime is an edge or not. In this case, we create a little bit dependence between these two, uh, which we call it maybe unordered pairs of points. These two unordered pair of points, if we have this FV and FV prime, somehow we will force a dependence between these two edges. They should be both edges or both non-edges. And the goal is to show that there are mildly dependent pairs if we have, the graph doesn't match uh, fairly uh, close to each other. So, so Tom, here is the intuitive idea. If uh, a non-trivial portion, say epsilon n of points uh, such that their neighbors, a non, also a non-trivial portion of their neighbors uh, doesn't have FVW, equal to W. Then we can argue that there are some uh, C epsilon uh, n square P over two numbers of dependent pairs, where dependent pair is what we mentioned like this. And this, of course, this is the expected numbers. m square p over two is roughly the numbers of edges inside uh, the GMP graph. So you have a non true you can detect a non-trivial portion of dependent pairs. You can argue in this way with very high probability. But how can we, uh, the, the, really the problem is how to make it to be a, a detectable event, right? Where you can compute the probability. So what we'll do next is suppose that is the case. You have many edges does not match correctly and you, know that there are many of such uh, uh, dependent pairs. We will then sample many points in the, uh, in the vertex set, but not all of them. So I will sample a little O n. I don't want to bother with the, the precise numbers, such that uh, for each V in this uh, samples, we sample some points here. Uh, I review the neighbors of V and F V. Now, I just want to remark that uh, if I sample this, actually, I don't know whether for two neighbors of V, whether they are connected by an edge or not. However, if uh, with high probability, if we do it randomly, one can observe some non-trivial portion of these uh, dependent pairs. To observe a dependent pairs is sufficient to review this, right? I don't need to review whether they are connected by an edge or not. Then, now I'll forget that. I will just consider some deterministic structure. I'll consider V and W and V to represent, uh, I will guess what is the neighbors of V and then GV is to be a sort of a representation of uh, FV. But this is a deterministic before scanning, uh, I sample the graph gammas. But whether there are some non-trivial portion of dependent pairs or not can be detected by this structure. 
uh, which is uh, efficient. Then I'll ask the probability that, okay, what is the chance that gamma agrees with the above structures? So it's for every V in V double prime, V equal to WV and FV equal to GV. This probability can be bounded by the numbers of dependent pairs we have. And then this is roughly, this is having one dependent pair is roughly the probability is one minus P, but then you rise to the power of how many such dependent pairs. And okay, sorry. This probability is large enough to beat all the typical realization of the deterministic structure. So then by union bounds, we argue that this is sufficient to tell that okay, there shouldn't be uh, this many uh, dependent pairs because we run over all possible uh, typical uh, structures there and show that the probability of having a dependent pair is very narrow. So that's how we show that gamma should be equal to gamma two, roughly the idea. And okay, I should stop here. Thank you very much.